Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Test Tube Plus. I'm Trace. This is our episode number five of our series on weather. If you've never watched our show before, we take a big topic and we try and break it into smaller chunks so we can all understand it a little bit better. And this week we're talking about the weather, which again, we didn't think was gonna be a sexy topic, but it turns out this is crazy and it's super interesting. So make sure you check out the other four episodes on weather. Pretty easy to find in the show notes. We've talked a lot about climate change and we've talked about mass extinction. We've talked about how ancient people have handled the weather, but what about our, you know, descendants? How are they gonna handle the weather? How are people 200 years from now gonna handle the weather that we're leaving them? Because let's be honest, we're affecting it, so we're gonna leave it to them. They're inheriting the weather that we give them. In 1946, Irving Langmuir and Vincent Schaefer discovered that they could create ice crystals inside of a super cooled cloud and they could make snow, they could create it. That's a pretty big deal. Because if you can make snow, we've shown in the past that if we can make snow or we can change the weather, we can affect whole battles. We can change where things happen. We can change how things happen. We can change how battles play out. And if you do it on purpose, technically you're weaponizing weather, right? There was an Operation Popeye in the 70s. It was a highly classified program where clouds would get seeded with silver iodide and lead iodide. And that could extend monsoon periods by an average of a month, 30 to 45 days. And they used it in Southeast Asia during 1967 to 1972, which you might recognize as when we were in Vietnam. <laughs> so this was a way for the United States to try and weaponize the weather. They spent five years and $21.6 million seeding clouds all over the Ho Chi Minh Trail. All they were trying to do, mess up military supply routes. Then the NMOD came out, the Environmental Modification Convention, which is an international treaty that the military and other hostile use of environment modification techniques is no longer allowed. They don't want to have widespread, long-lasting, severe effects on the Earth from military modification of the weather. This came out in 1977 in Geneva, and it entered into law, or international treaty really, in October of 1978. So since then, we haven't really been allowed to mess with the weather militarily. That being said, we still do mess with it, and we probably will continue to do so as we learn more about it. Many countries seed their clouds. Uh, entire cities in China seed clouds. China has a weather modification department where they employ and train 32,000 people using more than 12,000 anti-aircraft guns and rocket launchers in addition to about 30 planes to shoot silver iodide into the clouds. That sounds kind of like the 19th century Americans, doesn't it? During the Beijing Olympics, China promised the world great weather, and they delivered because they launched 1,104 rain dispersal rockets from 21 sites around the city to ensure clear skies during the Olympics opening ceremony. That's insane. But cloud seeding is pretty interesting because you can make it rain or you can disperse clouds. If you make it rain elsewhere, those clouds never make it to another spot. So again, you could use this for weapons. Let's hope that nobody's doing that considering it's currently against your Geneva Convention. But when you do that, the King of Thailand owns a proprietary patent on cloud seeding or at least on one technique using to do cloud seeding. The US uses the technique to dissipate fog around airports and to minimize the size of hailstones because that could cause all sorts of problems with flights. There's even a conspiracy theory about something called HARP. So according to this, HARP has been using this electromagnetic radiation stuff, not very specific, to alter the weather by shooting it into the ionosphere. The ionosphere is a layer of the atmosphere that AM radio bounced off. It's a charged section of the atmosphere and that could maybe, according to these theories, be altering the weather. Here's a quote from the Secretary of Defense, William S. Cohen. You can actually get from the Defense Department's website. And it says, others, implying terrorists, are engaging even in an ecotype of terrorism whereby they can alter the climate, set off earthquakes, volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. So there are plenty of ingenious minds out there that are at work finding ways in which they can wreak terror upon other nations. It's real, and that's the reason why we have to intensify our counterterrorism efforts. The thing is, a lot of terrorists aren't part of the Geneva Conventions. Maybe you knew that already. So they can militarize it, even if we don't. There are also things that we're talking about in the future. This is mostly now, modern technology. But the future 
What are we going to do to combat climate change? Obviously, we can use computer models. We can take natural disasters. We can look at pandemics, and we can create models around those. So why not more about the weather and how to combat that? Some big ways that you can help, or we can all help, is we can build cities that are safer, that are more sustainable. There's something called the urban heat effect, where when you build cities a certain way, they raise the temperature of the surrounding area, and that could cause climate changes, or at least weather changes. It's definitely a thing. You can look that up for sure. You can also bring food sources closer to your home. You can live more sustainably, lower your carbon footprint, eat, eat locally. All of these things are ways that we can fix our carbon output and then change how we live in the future. And chances are, in the future, our descendants are going to do these things because they're going to have to. Because it's only going to get worse if we don't make changes. If we're still driving things all over the place and shipping things all over the place, we're going to have a lot of carbon flying into the atmosphere forever, unless we change what it is that's running those engines, what it is that's burning those fossil fuels. If we can stop burning them all together, that would be even better. But hey, you can't. It's still the main way we can get energy. So there's this thing called geoengineering, which is the idea that we can alter the planet now. We've got enough technology, we can make it better. Obviously, things like terraforming are part of geoengineering, which is changing a whole chunk of the planet to whatever we would like. And to do this, we're going to need some real big construction projects. For example, solar management. Solar management will reduce the amount of sunlight that hits the surface of the planet. It seems pretty extreme, but this is one way we can keep the planet from warming up while we wait for the carbon in the atmosphere to dissipate. To reduce the sunlight that hits the planet, future generations may have to inject reflective particles into the atmosphere above rain so that they won't rain back down, but way, way up in the upper atmosphere. That way it will reflect more sunlight out into the space. Once that's reflected, it won't heat up the planet, and thus our planet will cool off. We could have those particles floating in the stratosphere for up to two years, reflecting light and preventing sun from heating up the lower levels of the atmosphere. I sort of already said that. Harvard physicist David Keith has suggested that it would even be possible to engineer particles into tiny little disks with self-levitating properties that could keep them remaining in the stratosphere for 20 years, blocking that sunlight. There are even talks of putting sunshades out in space, far enough away from the Earth where you wouldn't actually see a shadow on our planet, but close enough that it could block huge sections of sunlight. In doing so, it would achieve a similar effect to the particles in the atmosphere, but it would take a lot more resources to get it that far away. But if we did that, it would be a permanent solution. It could just sit there until we would have to replace it because the environment of space is pretty harsh. That would lower surface temperatures again. We would still have high levels of carbon. We would still have high levels of methane, but we can handle that. The Earth overall can't handle that. We could also remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's one of the only geoengineering efforts that's attempted so far, and it was aimed at pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. And to do it, they're using a natural substance, algae. Algae can absorb that carbon dioxide because it does it all the time. It's a plant. So geoengineers fertilized patches of the southern sea with powdered iron. That powdered iron created a local algae bloom that algae bloom could suck in more carbon dioxide and produce oxygen. This is great. This is a great idea. Unfortunately, the diatoms released carbon back into the atmosphere when they died, instead of just transporting to the deep ocean after they died. They thought what would happen is as they seeded and created the algae blooms, they would absorb all that CO2 and then sink to the bottom of the ocean with it trapping it down there, which is similar to what happens in glaciers. They capture a lot of gases. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. But it's a really cool idea, and it's a step in the right direction. Tim Kruger, the head of Oxford Martin School's geoengineering efforts, suggests that heating limestone might help, because if you add lime to seawater, it absorbs almost twice as much carbon dioxide as it used to absorb, which would also counteract ocean acidification. Also a big deal and a big problem, not necessarily weather-related in this case, but you get the point. 
Unfortunately, until we do more studies, we won't know what people are going to do in the future to try and combat climate change, try and fix the weather. There might be more cloud seeding efforts to try and make it rain in areas where the deserts have encroached on farmland. There might be more irrigation efforts to try and get areas like in Egypt where they're trying to get more farmland to feed more people. And in fact, for a while in the country of Egypt, there was a second Nile plant to try and pull water from Lake Nasser all the way into the Mediterranean. Um, it was literally a giant river parallel to the Nile. And how that would have affected the local weather is unknown. I mean, there are all sorts of different ways humans are attempting to change their local weather patterns and to change our overall climate. But our best chance of survival might be to leave, to let it be, to leave it alone, to let it work itself out. Because right now, if we just left it alone now, it's still going to take decades upon decades to return to normal. Because we released so much carbon and methane into our atmosphere. So maybe we should just get out of here, leave it, turn it into a national park. <laughs> It'd be a good one to visit. Good camping, I hear. This is a pretty intense series, pretty intense episode. I hope you feel like you understand the weather a little more. I think you understand, hopefully, how people have interacted with it throughout history and maybe even a little more about climate change. If you weren't aware of all of the nuances of that, we did not touch on most of them. There's a lot more. You can definitely tweet at me on Twitter if you uh, have any questions about that. But make sure you subscribe for more Test Tube Plus. And if you can't wait for more Test Tube Plus tomorrow, Check out last week's episodes on dreams, nightmares, all sorts of cool stuff about why we dream. And come back tomorrow for more Test 2 Plus. We'll see you then.